We're going to talk this morning about best practices in team-oriented development, and of course that leads to all kinds of fun things like user interface standards, deployment practices, um, and project estimating. How many people here by a show of hands have ever heard the word fun in the same sentence as project estimating before? <laughs> Not too many, right? Yeah. It's, it's interesting because Notes is such a phenomenally good platform for helping users work together there really are some pretty big roadblocks to helping developers work together in the platform. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm of the opinion that there's not a lot of these best practices out there. Um, some of the stuff that's out there, um, is anybody here from Lotus? Okay, good, we can talk honestly now. Um, some of the stuff that's out there from Lotus, like the R5 best practices guide, I'm sorry, is wrong. They say things like use replica IDs for cross database lookups. Has anybody ever had a replica ID lookup not work correctly? I mean, yeah, there's a lot of problems with that in the real world. So what we're gonna talk about today is um, how you can go back to your organizations and try to put together a process, a methodology, for those of you from a consultancy, that really helps your applications run better, your teams develop, faster, easier, hopefully have a lot more fun developing it. So what are we going to do? Um, we're going to talk about who, who typically comes to this presentation. I've given this quite a bit. Um, what can we learn from others? Part of what the term, I think, best practices implies is that I'm going to look at where somebody else went wrong and not do that. And I'm going to find out what works in my environment. And there are some specific technical things that we can all do that do that. Um, very quickly. Um, just like around the water cooler, we'll all complain for about three minutes about why this is hard. We'll review some of the problems inherent in this. Uh, and then the most important thing is number four. We're going to talk about the specific technical steps I'd like to recommend that you go through in your environment to build a whole environment that supports your developers and your administrators, because um, they're important people too. Um, yes, I will show you a lot. As a matter of fact, I'm going to spend most of the time in the designer client. And can I ask questions? No, nobody can ask any questions whatsoever. You have to take this all on faith. Uh, no, you can, of course, ask questions. I'm going to leave about 15 minutes, or I'm going to try to leave about 15 minutes at the end of the presentation for Q&A. Um, part of what best practices is, I was speaking with a couple people up front, um, you know, best practices uh, is kind of my impression or your impression of best practices are obviously different things. What I think is a best practice, you might find an adequate practice. So we'll leave 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, what kind of people typically come to this thing? Um, best practices are very necessary when you're running multiple development projects simultaneously. Um, I'm a consultant, Experio Solutions is a consultancy with about, I think, 800 consultants. We have about 22 full-time notes and domino developers. And we go into a lot of organizations, and they have application development factories within their own companies, and they churn out 100 to 150, 200 notes applications a year in some of these larger organizations. So you really need standards when you're that size. Um, also. By implementing best practices, I think you can also build better quality applications. It's very easy to throw together a Notes app that works well on one server with 50 users. Of course, we all know it's quite another deal to have it work across 50 servers in you know, seven time zones with a couple thousand users. Um, best practices also help you if you have a limited development staff. And I'll talk to a bullet point that has some specific data about that in a moment. Um, if you have less experienced note staff, i.e. if, um, I don't know if anyone has ever happened this in their environment, but sometimes you have like a power user who becomes your primary developer, and then they're writing stuff for the CEO. That never happens, right? <laughs> None of us have ever faced that. Those folks need help, and one of the reasons they need help is that they're new to development generally, not, uh, not just in notes. And the other thing that I'd like to challenge us all to think about is that best practices can help reduce the maintenance cycle. You know, that stuff you have to do after the fun part of the application development is over and you're, you're married to the application for the next four, five, six years. Best practices also help there. How do we avoid the potholes? What can we learn from other people? There's a consultancy, kind of like a mini Gartner, kind of like a Raticati group. Is Seth early here? 
Seth said he might come, he might be presenting. Seth Early has a consultancy called Early and Associates, and they studied 169 organizations that have deployed notes. This was everything from 15-man law firms that used it pretty much for email only, all the way up to very large 50, 60, 70,000 seat installs. This was several years ago. It could perhaps be a little bit dated, but the theme that they heard over and over and over again is that the greatest challenges, according to organizations that deploy notes, are one, insufficient programming resources, and two, lack of application development standards. They didn't realize how much they would need to write notes applications over and over and over and over again. They'd have to write a lot of them. And they also didn't realize that, okay, we'll put in notes, we'll throw a developer at it, and then nine months later, I've got five developers, I've got five development standards, and my UIs are all across the board, and, and large organizations that really hurts notes and domino. You really need to do that. So, I, you know, I think we can all agree that this is an issue. By the way, at the very end of the presentation, I'm gonna put up my email address. If you don't wanna take notes, just shoot me an email. I will email you back and send you a URL to download this from on the internet. So don't worry about having to write this whole stuff down. This isn't exactly what's in the, uh, in the Lotusphere website. They make you submit your final presentation like December 7th or something. All right, why is this hard? We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but I think it's important to look back and say, why is this painful so that you can fix it going forward? What kind of things do we have in the notes environment? Nobody ever has any rogue notes developers in their organization, do they? Nobody, right? Cowboy coders, why is this? Why do we seem to have so many people in the notes environment that are so darn iconoclastic. Well, for many Notes and Domino developers, it's their very first programming language. You start as a shipping clerk, and then by night, I'm a developer, you know? And because you've never gone to college and you don't have a classical IT training, things like human factors, you know, useful interface design are not part of your DNA. You, you come to this and you think formula language is pretty cool, so you get good at whacking together your first view, and the next thing you know, you think Lotus Script isn't too bad. Next thing you know, they're moving on to HTML, and they're out of control. So these are people who are not classically trained developers. Um, and, and some of the problems there is that you know, they think because the good Lord put 15 fonts on their workstation, there should be 15 fonts on a form. Right. Um, human factors, kind of, kind of important. Uh, another thing that had been harder in the past, but R, R6 or, or uh, Note 6 is going to make better, is change management. Notes doesn't inherently have change control. So here's this great, very polymorphous data store that replicates all around the world, but it's very easy for Joe to step on Sam's changes, and it happens all the time. We've all had save conflicts, and unfortunately, um, Lotus and Iris and IBM and uh, those guys are just now getting around to some rudimentary change management. But the change management that's coming in Note 6 is still probably only at the object level. They still don't have things like version control and parallel development paths and branching. They don't have any of that kind of stuff. And in really big notes projects and domino projects, you need that. Um, lack of UI standards. Um, a fat client is good, but a fat client can also be bad. And I'll talk a lot more about UI standards. Uh, source code version control. Again, you know, Joe can step on Sam's stuff. And this last bullet, this sixth bullet, is something I really want to spend most of the time on. And if you take away anything from this morning's presentation, I want you to think about these types of things. Um, quick survey. How many people here have one or two developers in their organization by a show of hands? Okay. Uh, it's about 20%, it looks like. Okay. Three to five? Okay. About another 20%. Um, six to 15. Oh, wow, that's actually quite a lot of you. And then 16 or greater. Wow, okay, so those are really large notes development organizations. All right, for everybody who just held up their hand for 16 or greater, how many people have 16 different approaches or more to doing lookups? <laughs> right, okay. This is one of the key concepts I want to get over, and I'll show you some specific technical approaches to address that. Um, it really, really, really takes a lot of time. 
for developer A to come into developer's B stuff and figure out how they did it. Well, on Wednesdays, they tend to do it internal into the database. But on Fridays, if they're wearing a blue shirt, they do it to an external database on this server. But on Saturdays, they like to do it a different way entirely. So we're going to look at a way to create a real formal approach to doing keywords in Notes and Domino and lookups of database A to database B. And then if you're really want to ace the final exam, which will be at 11.45 today. Uh, we'll even talk about things like a standard approach to workflow. All right. Those are the problems with working with new Notes developers or, or even seasoned Notes developers that are iconic and plastic. Notes itself inherently has some problems. As I mentioned, it's easy. We all know to write a very simple Notes app that works well, um, but it's harder to scale. There's no formal language standards. There's no such thing as lint. Those of you who work in C, there's no such thing as uh, lint to pass your code through and say, yeah, this is a good approach or a bad approach, other than things like the Lowe's Best Practices Guide. And then finally, um, notes applications, unfortunately, have this long legacy of, oh, it's a proof of concept. We'll slap it together, we'll see if people like it, and we'll put it out there. And on Tuesday, you roll out this proof of concept, and by Friday, we can't believe we ever lived without this. Right? So a lot of times we don't take the time to architect these things that we would if we knew it was going to be running across the world on a bunch of servers. All right, so what do we need to do? This is how you go back and you do it in your environment. We want to make our developers work faster. We want to develop some formal best practices. We want to do these. Uh, we want to do the applications that we develop to be more reliable. And let's skip past all this. All right, how should you go back? What, what kind of physical components, if, if this presentation is going to be any good to you guys at all. What physical things do you need to do in your environment? One, look around at what you're doing today and figure out what works. This is important. It's best not to reproduce bad practices. Here's a little tip. Don't reuse bad code, right? So look around in your organization and see what works and see what doesn't work. Then, once you think about what doesn't work at the abstract level, Think about the types of design objects that you'll need to implement those, those approaches or those theories. So if the first bullet is an approach, I want software-driven interfaces, I don't want to hard code things, then your second bullet should be, OK, well, if I don't want to hard code things, like a, if I'm in database A and I need to look up database B, I'll obviously need some code object that does that. Maybe it's a formula language, maybe it's a script library, maybe it's, it's something else. So think about how you're going to do those. Then, diving down into the next level, you'll actually need to build them. Finally, uh, I'm sorry, not finally. Fourth, you'll need to talk, if you really want to get serious about this stuff, about some infrastructure issues. I'm sorry, while it is technically possible to run development in a production environment, the risk is so great that you really need to, if you haven't done it already, pony up the bucks, talk to your manager, and get a separate development environment and get a separate testing environment. So you need to do some plumbing type stuff. Uh, and then lastly, probably the least fun of all is putting together the procedures that say, OK, we have these code objects. Here's this widget. Here's this script library. Here's this subform. Here's how you use it. Put together real formal standards on how to do it. This is all very high level and very abstract. We will drill down. All right. Examples of the first bullet. What works best? Software-driven interfaces. Hard coding server names is bad. Um, hard coding directory names is also bad. You want to avoid that. Um, has anybody ever, ever seen a really monkey butt ugly notes application ever? But somebody else wrote it, right? <laughs> okay. Think about take two, three, four days uh, to come up with a standard UI. Um, I'm not here to tell you that nine point left justified, eight point dark black Helvetica is the be all and end all font. I'm not evangelical about it. Just pick a font and stick to it. And we'll go into some examples of that. Um, try to design it from day one to run across your entire organization. Um, also, think about reusability, and I'll show you some real specific techniques there to do that. Um, here's a nutty concept. Try to make notes do what it does best and try to step around the potholes that it doesn't do so well. So if those are the approaches that I want to take, what type of code objects might you need in your environment to do that? Well, 
if we say that we don't want to use replica IDs, if we want to go from database A to database B, C, or D without hard coding things, we're going to need some repository to store that. Obviously, that's a piece of data at that point. So you have a couple different approaches. I'll show you one that we use uh, that I think a lot of people are getting very successful with. In terms of reusability, you should be able in your organization to build things like subforms, script libraries, views that you can use in every single application that you develop. And I'll show you a couple examples of those. Uh, generic error script handlers to deal with other people's problems when their script bombs out. Um, Object-oriented agents. By that I mean things that can work in your applications, any application, irrespective of form names, view names, database locations. We have an agent that we wrote called delete response document or delete orphan documents. When you delete the parent of a response document, of course, the response is orphaned and it's floating around. You ever have a database that's like got three documents in it that's 90 meg and it doesn't support attachments? You know, you can have those response documents. We created a script that walks through and just walks the dollar ref hierarchy and looks up the parent and if it can't find it, it says, gee, you must be an orphan, and whacks it. Those are the kinds of things that now any of our developers can drop into their application and use it. Um, three up, the starter views, forms, frame sets, that's really important. Um, Build-in help system, and this last bullet, I'll show you a technique that I think you might like for a debugging form. Um, all right. One of the things I'm going I'm to talk about today are uh, two specific design objects that I think you might want to consider developing in your own organization. One we call the GDK, one we refer to as the CDE. In our industry, we have to have TLAs, three-letter acronyms, right? And it's even better if they rhyme. So we have both a GDK and a CDE. The CDE is hopefully the most powerful concept you'll take away from this morning's presentation. By that I mean this is the template that I use. When I say file, database, new, I pick this thing called the CDE, or my common design elements, and it brings in all of these standard objects that I, in my earlier set of work, figured out, yes, this is a be best practice, this is how I want my UI to look, and it's got those code objects that make it work. I'll show you specifically how to build a CDE, but I better get moving if I don't run out of time. All right, finally, the last thing you'll need to do, as I mentioned, is you'll need separate development, testing, and production environments. Um, deployment. Deployment is tough. I'll give you a proposed deployment methodology, but we can talk about that. Um, it's tough to deploy big, complex notes applications. Why? Not everything lives in the NSF. You could have program documents that were required in the Domino directory. Obviously, you may require groups. There's a bunch of ACL settings. You might need graphics moved into certain locations. Helping put that package together of all the little pieces parts is another issue that you'll have to address. Uh, and then obviously, there are some third-party products like uh, Team Studio Chow that can help um, with some of those issues. All right. What are you going to end up with when everything's done? You'll end up with something that has your best practices. This will be a guidebook. I'll talk about the GDK and the CDE. These are actually code components. Uh, and then you'll have a bunch of best practices. You know what? I'm seeing that we're running. I am running. Not you guys. You're not running. I'm running. I'm running a little bit late. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip past all of this stuff. And I'm going to get to the pay dirt. All right. How many people here would like to develop software in front of 250 people watching you? <laughs> Just a little bit scary, right? All right, what we've got is this is what every one of our developers has on one panel on their workspace. Um, desk. I'm sorry, old habits die hard. I have, in my, I have gray in my beard, sorry about that. Um, yes, you, we can also put this in the, uh, in the bookmarks tab. Um, the things that we've got here, uh, the first thing I'd like to, to dive into is the GDK. Remember, I, I suggest to you that replica IDs are probably a bad idea for doing cross-database lookup. If you're not going to use replica IDs, you need a data store. So what we've 
put together is a database called the GDK. It stands for Global Databases and Keywords. Any application that needs to reference another database will call into this GDK and grab the location from it and then go open it up. So anytime I need to do a lookup from database A to database B, I'll come into here. I'm going to build a database right now, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start out by defining that database. Well, I have what we call a database alias, and I'm going to call this, with all the stuff in the news, I'm going to call my database audit tracking. We're going to build a database to track the results of external audits of our organization. Um, I don't type very well standing up. I'm going to put it here. need to move my mouse. All right, a couple things. If you build a data repository that will help you remove some of your direct references to databases, I have a couple suggestions. You might want to put these two fields on here. One, should this database be replicated locally? Yes or no. Two, would you like it added to the workspace? Yes or no. And then this is kind of different. What job roles will this database be used in? What we're building is basically a database dictionary. We're building a list of all the people who might need this thing. So I'm going to say who might need this. C-level executives. And I'm also going to add accounting. Anybody in the accounting job role? And I could put some comments here. Okay. Why do I need that? Well, in all my code, I'm going to refer to this alias. This is my handle that I'll use to grab the object. But now, since I have this nice little database of databases, it doesn't replace the catalog in any manner, shape, or form. It's only used for programming. I can take advantage of that. Um, if you deploy large applications that have multiple databases within them, if they're running in the notes client, you, you're going to replicate them locally, you have to get them on the workspace. So why not take advantage of this data that's here? What we've got is you get a new laptop. You're new to the organization. They put the laptop on your desk. They install the OS. There's notes and domino. You add one database icon. You can work with profiles, sure, but you know, that requires the administrators to collaborate with the developers, and we wouldn't want that to happen. So uh, what you can do as developers is maintain it all here. There's a you add one database to your workspace, this database dictionary that you're going to build in your environment, and you can tap into these job roles and say, okay, I'm new here. I need to add some icons to my workspace. You can prompt and say, what job roles do you do? What is your role within the organization? You tick off or select those roles that you perform in the organization, and then it traverses this entire list Oh, I haven't built the database yet. It's trying to add it. Um, it'll add all those icons to your workspace. So when people come in and they're new, it's helpful. What's even better, though, is when you have to like, build out 30 laptops for a Salesforce application, you have to replicate all the databases on all 30 laptops. You can pick up the data that's in these individual documents and say, should this database be replicated locally? And you can do the same thing with a different button that says, make local replicas. So you get the laptop, you put notes on it, you add one icon to the workspace, your GDK, and then you punch the button, make local replicas, it asks you which job roles you're in, and it then goes through the process of replicating all the databases to your local uh, laptop. It puts it in the correct directory. It puts it with the correct file name. It's kind of handy, helps out with employment. Um, the other thing that's in this database, aside from my data directory, remember this database, apps audit track. I should probably copy that to the clipboard, huh? That'll be handy later. Is keywords. Um, how many people here have more than three or four different approaches in their organization to handling keywords within Notes apps? Anybody? It's an incredible amount of time that you waste, isn't it, trying to maintain those things? So what we recommend is that you consider an approach where um, every single application that you develop puts its keywords in this database unless 
it's going to be something like a discussion library where you're going to clone multiple instances of it and each instance has its own required keywords list. Maybe you have like a project management template that's going to be for each new project you build it. That one might need its own keywords, but here's a list of keywords that everybody in our organization uses for anything that they build. What's in a keyword list? Well, here's a real handy one. This is the, uh, the United States. Okay, so I have a keyword, again I have an alias called states-us, and here they all are. It also tells me which databases I require this keyword in. So now I'm going to go build a new database and reference all this stuff. So I want my keywords in this GDK, I want my database locations in here. Figure out those types of little code objects that are reflective of best practices and build them into a template that you use to start all application development. I said I'm going to build an audit tracking database. I have my template which contains our organization's best practices. I pick the common design elements, our CDE, out of the list, and I'm going to disable future design changes. And there's a reason for that. I'll show you. All right. So I'm going to say go build me this database based on this design template. Through the miracle that is notes, I now have an empty database shell. Well, what's in my database shell? I got in my audit tracking database an outline, a frame set, a couple pages, one, two, three, four, five forms, two views, a folder, a navigator, three agents. I feel like saying a partridge in a pear tree. A boatload of image resources and four very important subforms. There's a couple shared fields and three very important script libraries. So what did I just get? What does this do for me now? Well, without doing other than anything other than saying file database new, I now have the shell of an application that fits all of my UI standards. I have uh, a navigator. If I choose, I can use a frame set. Um, and it's ready for me to start coding in this thing. Well, 20% of any notes development project is, of course, the database icon. So let me go snag a database icon. <laughs> One of the things I recommend is if you're going to build best practices in your organization, standardize on an icon library that everybody can get to. Put it all together, grouping. Don't put one icon per document. Put them all together. So I know I want something that looks like a book. Put all the books together. Don't make each book an individual document. I'll copy the database icon to the clipboard. And if you're going to build that icon library that all of your developers use, also make it a reference to have all of the view icons in there. So if I'm developing and I know I need the um, thermometer that's half full as opposed to the thermometer that's only a quarter full, I know how to get that. The other thing, uh, I'd like to thank Mick Monard for Unipart for pointing out the uh, dollar paper color field. I don't know if you're aware of it, but um, if your forms contain a field called dollar paper color, um, you can set the background of your form programmatically. So we have a reference here that shows our developers um, what, uh, if your dollar paper color is 39, it's this lovely light teal, but if it's 35, it's this light umber. So um, these are, of course, subjective, whether it's using or not. This is just a quick reference library, so it's something to consider. I'm now going to go into my application, and of course you can't have a notes application without the icon. So I'll paste it in. Here's a trick. Our help about and help using documents are also already pre-built. So as you build your template that's your best practices, come up with some formal standards for what you want in your help using and help about. Your administrators probably have some suggestions on that because, of course, it goes into the catalog. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paste. Yep, I took it off the clipboard. Stupid me. Copy. I'll put it in here. About audit tracking. Notice that the fonts are already preset, so all I have to do is fill out the form. I want a form that I can just go in and type. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to save that. I'm also, just for the sake of brevity, I'm going to paste my icon in here. Notice my navigator very clearly indicates to my developers what they need to do, put something here, in other words. 
I'll save that, and I'll pick up a view that I need there. So in about the space of four minutes, I have now an application that's starting to have a UI that's standard across our organization. Let's jump into forms because that's where a lot of us spend most of our time. Because I inherited from my common design elements, my common design elements has some small granular components that I use over and over again in every application. One of the most important is something that we call the standard form header. I think a lot of people have an approach like this. This is a subform that's at the top of every single form. It has a standard approach to displaying what form you're in. It also should contain, when you build this in your environment, a variety of those standard vanilla, need them on almost every form buttons. Save, close, edit. Here's a tip. If you put this on your standard form, your subform, and you use that in every form that you build, you need some way to turn these things off. Because just because I've got a standard edit button on a form, automatically doesn't mean I can use that. Let's say I need to do like a query mode change or, or check some security before I allow the document to go into edit mode. So what we do is every one of these buttons has a hide when. And there's a computed for display field on the form called buttons to hide. So if I want to turn off the close window button on any form that I develop, all I have to do is add that buttons to hide, add the word close to the buttons to hide. How do you use something like this? Let's jump into the form and take a look. First thing, first form I want to make is a uh, form that just a high level track the results of the audit. Um, here's my standard subform. It's got all those four buttons on it, all the standard ones that come in as a result of R5 automatically. So I'm going to say audit information. Notice that all my fonts are automatically preset for me. I've already got a layout of how I like the fields to look and how I want the fields to work. All I'm going to do is double click on this and say, what is this form? Very nicely, it reminds me that I need to enter the name of the form function. This is going to be the audit master document. I'm going to save the form. I should probably call it something, huh? And now in my application, when I say create audit master, I have a UI that's very much pre-built for me. I have, how long has this taken? It's taken about 10 or 11 minutes. I've already got a form that is laid out the way I like. Is this a perfect layout? Maybe, maybe not. You know, you design your own in your own environment. But the fact, the important concept to take away is that I have this CDE, this common design elements template, that because I built my new application from it, automatically brings over all the UI standards. UI standards, I'm sorry, I think they're a pain in the butt. They're not fun to do if you have to retrofit them into your existing application. But if your application comes up with the right standards automatically, it doesn't get in your way so much. So consider that approach. All right. Remember I said that I thought that um, it was really a lot of work for most organizations to have different approaches to keyword lookups. Remember we have this GDK, and there's a list of keywords in here. The one I want to pull out right now is called states-us, and I want my keyword list to automatically give me all those choices. Well, back here in my application, in my form, I have, for my developer, as a convenience, already pre-built some code that allows my developer to do a lookup. So when I double click on it, I'll go into the logic of the code. Let me pull up that window. What this code does is goes over to the GDK and using an application, that, using an alias that I pass it, gives it the information necessary to return the keyword list. So I'm a new developer. All I need to do now is come in here. It was what, states-us, I think? T-E-S-U-S. That's all I need to do. It, this is going to be the key that I'm going to use to go perform the lookup. File save. And I probably should change the label on this field to reflect what it's real. Um, I 
And now, when I go create one of these, it automatically knows how to perform the lookup. The nice thing about that code that I pre-built in my template is that it automatically handles issues of am I on the server, am I not on the server. The only thing that that requires is one database in all of our infrastructure has to be in one place and it has to have one name, and that's the GDK. The GDK has to be called a certain thing because all the applications call into it, but that's the only thing that's hard-coded in our entire environment, and then everything else can count on that much like you need to have a notes.ini, and then everything else gets soft from there. So that's a pretty powerful technique that I'd like to recommend. The other thing that's nice about this keyword handling approach is that if I just change this field, of course, it automatically picks it up. That's formula language. The other thing I'd recommend you do in your environment is that you'll probably need... You'll probably need to build a script library that gives you the same access to those variables. So what we've got is a function called go get us the keywords that does the same thing. In Lotus Script, I instantiate a variant, I pass it a single parameter, states-us, and what it gives me back is a variant with all the elements from that keyword list. So I, as a developer, I don't need to get into monkeying around and build my own approach to do it. The other th nice thing is that when I get hit by a truck tonight on the way to the airport at 4 o'clock, a developer who comes in and has to maintain my apps automatically knows where my keywords are going to be located. He knows how, or she knows how I'm going to look them up, and they'll know how to maintain my stuff. Another interesting fact about this approach is that it also not only reuses your code, but it reuses your data. In many, many organizations, there are 7, 10, 15, 100 different applications, each of which contains its own list of things like company locations or, or titles, you know, things that you get used in a lot, of, uh, a lot of different applications. With this approach, everybody knows where to go to get the keywords. All right. Let me build a second database now, file database new. Uh, I'm going to build a database of consulting firms. T-A-N-T-S, and because we've decided to have a team-oriented, a standard approach to it, I'm going to put it over here. It's called Apps Consultants. And again, I've got all those design objects, so I'm going to put this one down here. Because I just built a new database, I need to define it in the database dictionary. Uh, I'm going to call that Alias Consultants. No jokes about Arthur Anderson, please. Uh, Got to pick a couple job roles. Notice my user interface standard. We've defined in our organization uh, required fields are indicated with a red asterisk. So I know that that, I should have known that that was a required field. Now, I'm going to uh, put together a quick form here. I'm going to call my form Consulting Firms. I'm only going to add one. I'm only going to add one field to this form. I'm very quickly going to build a view. Notice that because I have this common design template that gives me a lot of my design objects, I have uh, two views automatically, dollar all. Uh, dollar all, you may remember from your mail file design, I suggest in your organizations you have this as part of your template. Why? If you're in development and documents disappear, this 
view is categorized by form name, so you can go find the document. And it's just a handy general all-purpose view. Again, we're trying to build reusable stuff. Uh, I'm going to build a new view. Is that me? I'm going to build a view of consultants. Can you guys hear me okay? Sounded a bit iffy there for a second. I just quickly need to whap this together here. I love developing in front of 250 people in real time. And I think I called that something like firm name. Yeah, good. Sort it. Yep. Everybody following along? Everybody know what I'm doing? Yeah, cool. Easy, right? Notes 101. Um, now that I've got my consulting database, let me put a couple consultants in here. Notice that my user interface standards already give me, again, a lot of the look. They're reminding me that as a developer I need to do some things. Uh, the other thing that my form does <laughs> is have some validation logic in it that I forgot to update. So, Notice I've got a standard approach. I just come in and I say, firm name, please provide a name for this company. So it's very standard. Everybody who comes along after me will know how to do it. Uh, great. Let me build a couple of those. Two. Organization three. All right. Now, I want to do a lookup from my audit tracking database into this consulting firm organization. I know that I have in here a view called CONS, C O N S, for consultants, and I know that it is going to be able to give me a DB column that I can bring it back with. But how do I get from database A to database B? Well, in my design template, I have reflected how I like lookups to be done. And I actually have it here in my standard form so that my developers know where to get to it. I'm going to click on the logic for this field and pull this up. All that I need to do is use the alias from the database that I want to go look up into, and I've got all this underlying code that knows how to make that happen. So. Let me quickly not click on the help icon. I go back into here, look in my GDK. I call that database consultants. So in my application that I'm developing, I would say, I need you, Mr. Lookup, or I'm going to do a DB column, to go get me the database called consultants. And that's all that I need to change, because I've got in here the code that goes to the GDK, looks up this alias, says, hey, where is this thing called consultants located? It does a DB lookup into the GDK, comes back and gives me that. And now in this, I'll use my view called cons. And that's all I should need to do. Let me create one. Yes, this is the white knuckle moment. And it's automatically done the lookup. So I don't have to know how any. <laughs> My mom would be so proud. <laughs> and she's certified, so that means something, OK? <laughs> Just dual principle, no kidding around. Um, does anybody think this kind of stuff helps? I mean, what, what, it, what, it, what it does is that when developer A leaves and developer B needs to come along, there's a tremendous amount of transparency in how things are done. So you should go look at the, building these kinds of little design objects that everybody 
has to agree works the same way, and then we all agree, we hold up our right hand, we put our left hand on the developer's Lotus Script Guide, and we say, I all promise I'm going to do it this way. It, you can see some of the benefits there. I'm starting to get to where I should get back into the, uh, the presentation again. There's a couple other components I want to show you from a coding perspective that are pretty sweet. Build into your applications a way to support them. One of the things, does the mic keep going out? Is that me? Jeff? I need to go backwards, I'm not. Ah, see, I thought I was on the lavaliers. I guess I'm just on the podium. Build into your applications ways to support them. Um, and the example that we've got is we've got uh, a form that's referenced as a subform. And what this form does is it picks up a lot of stuff in context. It picks up the current database you're in, what your username is, are you on a server, what time is it, what's today's date, all that kind of good junk. And then remember we have this standard subform, or you're going to develop in your organizations a standard subform that has all the buttons on it. Well, one of the buttons is give me some feedback. I'm a user and I want to complain, I want to report a bug, I want to pay a compliment that something's working very well. Give your users a way to do that in a standard approach. And so what every single form now in every application that we develop, I'll say create audit master, I have this little feedback button. And what the feedback button is supposed to do, but is not doing, is, let's see, create standard form. What the feedback button, I'm in the wrong one. What the feedback button does is it pops up in a, um, in a window, in a dialog box, uh, that subform. And the subform picks up who you are, where you are. In the query, query close event of that document, of that form, what it does is it mails all of that information to a project tracking database. So in any form that I can create, the users have the capability to submit a complaint. Don't make this directly right into your data. Why? Uh, your users are remote and you need to handle some support things via email as opposed to, you know, you don't want your users having to replicate your support tracking database. So think about putting a button that lets somebody in every application that you generate automatically submit a bug report and then pick it up in your bug tracking database and allow some triaging to occur. Do I need to move it over here? Do I need to move it over there? So those are some of the techniques uh, in trying to put together a standard approach. Uh, in terms of your template, build this little code library. But that's not all that you're going to have to do, unfortunately. You're going to have to put together real formal application development standards. And you're going to have to, unfortunately, put together things like fonts, colors, get into all that kind of stuff, put it together, and then document it. And then, this is critical, document where in your template you support that standard. If you build a template that has a lot of those standards pre-cooked into it in your document, say, go over here, use this subform, and that enforces that little design. The other nice thing about taking all the time and effort to do this is that if you have outside consultancies that come in to do development for you, you can drop this thing on their desk and say, do it this way, this is our corporate standard, or you don't get paid. And again, when they leave and you have to maintain that application, you've already got them following all of the standards. So take the time to do this. How do you do it? How do you come up with a formal UI standard? Some people put all of their developers in a room and the last person left conscious gets to decide what the user interface standard is. Um, a couple adherence to that approach. Um, it's tough. There's no automatic answer. You want to try to be collaborative. Uh, a suggestion. At the beginning of the meeting, when you try to formally design what your UI standards are, pick what your evaluation criteria should be. Should it be optimal performance? Should it be optimal portability? Let's say you have a large number of Macintoshes in your organization. Okay, that's a really bad idea, but uh, that's a bad example. <laughs> but if you had to be cross-platform, decide that our user interface standards are going to be based on cross-platform support, or our user interface standards are going to be based on X. Have some criteria at the beginning of this meeting when you try to get everybody t together to develop these formal standards, and that way, instead of just saying, well, no, I like Helvetica, well, no, I like Arial, and then there's always the guy in the back with the propeller hat that says, no, I want the Star Trek font, everybody can shoot that guy, and I'm one of them. Uh, 
you can say, no, that doesn't meet our selection criteria of the most portable or the best performing, et cetera, et cetera. So when you try to come up with these standards, uh, document them and do them. Um, error handling, you'll probably want to come up with some generic error script routines. Uh, put them, again, in your standards database. Here's an important tip, write this down. If you take the time to put together a formal database that has all of your tips, tricks, standards, there's two recommendations that at Experio we'd like to make to you. One, give them some way to disagree with the standard. Make this database not only the UI according to God, but also give them some way to say, you know, that doesn't work well on the web and I'd like to make a comment that we really shouldn't have picked seven point Helvetica as our standard font. So give your users, uh, your developers some way to make this a living document that can change over time. And if you work at a consulting organization and you build one of these things, one of these guidebooks with formal standards, you will probably also want to build in the ability to assess your client's compliance with a standard, or you may want that ability yourself to assess the compliance. So create these things called assessment documents that say, you know, you're not doing it the way I would, et cetera, et cetera. Give your people a way to get out because you will always find exceptions to the rules. All right, we've done a lot of cool stuff on the development side. We understand that we're going to need to put together a lot of very detailed documentation about um, why our ACLs need to be a certain way. Here's a great tip if you don't know it already. Remember we built that template and that template has all the examples of what needs to be in our final applications. Build your standard ACL into that template. When I said file database new, I automatically got the access control that we like for our organization. And the way that I did that is in my database access control list, I have these square bracketed ACL entries. If you didn't know this, when a new database is built, it, it automatically gets these settings as the new ACL in the new database. So another tip, build the ACL standards into your organization's template, and then when you go to build the applications, it'll automatically come up the right way. All right, so we've got a standard repository for our database lookups. We've got a standard way of handling keyword lookups now. Thank goodness for that. And we've got a couple other things. One, you'll probably want to build a standard repository where all your formulas are. Your database developers should subscribe to this using the R5 subscription feature so that they automatically get notified if new formulas are there. Um, you may want to consider creating a gatekeeper for this function because, you, again, you don't want to reproduce bad best practices. Those are worst practices and you don't want to reproduce those. So build a library that everybody can um, kind of request. I would like to nominate this for a best practice. Here's a tip. Consider, if you are a manager or you have the authority to do this, consider redesigning your compensation plan for contribution to the standards database and use of the standards database. We have a couple different clients that 5% of a developer's pay is related to X number or more contributions per year to the standard. It's not a ton of money but it's enough to really make people sit up and take notice. The other thing that they do is they compensate 5% for reusing existing code. When an application goes into the formal test mode, they are asked to say, show me examples of our best practices that you've employed out of the formula library, and if they get X number more, that goes on their annual review. So in total, it's 10% of their compensation. You want to be a cowboy coder? go for it, but you're going to shoot yourself in the wallet. And it, it's up to you to develop, you know, how much you may want. It's just a suggestion. Um, there's a bunch of other stuff that needs to happen, too. Um, in addition to um, all the technical stuff we've done to make that um, happen from a coding standard, there's other, proce other parts of the process. Um, project estimating, not everybody's favorite thing to do. If you've built a template that has a large number of design, you know, widgets, forms, views, and stuff like that, build that into 
an Excel worksheet, or I'm sorry, a Lotus 123 worksheet that you can use to perform your estimating. What we've got here is our standard estimating worksheet, and it contains all of those little design objects that I know I'm automatically going to get as part of using the CDE. So if I'm a business analyst and I sit down with a user to start talking about their requirements, I come back with a requirements document and I sit down with a technical person and I say, okay, we're going to need, um, obviously we need to um, probably have a, a three hour meeting to kick this thing off with the client. Um, I'm going to have to, let's say it's a very complex application, it's going to require some architecture work. Um, re use this template to remind yourself about the things that you forget. Weekly team meetings, chew up a ton of time. Factor it in by building it into your standard template. And let's say I know I'm going to have three forms that are of very low complexity. I've arbitrarily picked four hours for those. I got five forms that are very highly complex. Those are four hours each. And by just kind of picking and choosing here, I know, okay, I'm going to need the audit tracking form. I can il illustrate them individually if I want. It automatically does the math. Okay, so I've got all my script libraries automatically come in. Don't forget time for documentation, testing, and deployment. A couple tricks is it's automatically calculating the function points. Those of you who are interested in CMM levels of, of trying to estimate can use the function point count. But more importantly, it's got the total estimated number of hours. Based on some of the stuff I don't need any time for. Um, for instance, we always get a dollar all view. So even if I have one of those, it doesn't add any time because I get it automatically. Here's a suggestion. Base your project management pro process on the level of complexity within the application. So consider a um, consider an approach where you say, I have to manage prog projects across a continuum. And small projects, which I'm going to define as, let's say, less than 20 hours, all that I need for project management there is I need to put together the spreadsheet with the estimate, I need a charge code, and I need just give me a printout of what you want this thing to look like. If I'm doing a medium application, though, which in my estimate comes up with less than or equal to 40 hours, then I need the name of an executive sponsor and some design documents. For large, I need a project plan, I need a deployment plan, and for jumbo applications, you know, those really difficult, really complex ones, um, I need really formal project management. So don't try to make your best practices, one best practice, fit all applications. Consider kind of a, a scale that allows you to move across a continuum of, uh, of application project management practices. A uh, couple other things that are necessary, evil in the notes and domino environment. Um, you will probably very seriously need three different domains, and by domain I mean three separate replica ID notes address books. Why do you want them in three separate domains? Because you don't want any mistakes which happen to an agent which happened to clobber half the person documents in the public address book over here to get to over here. So build three separate domains. If you live in a highly regulated or a highly validated environment, you're in the utilities industry, you're responsible for manufacturing food and drugs, and there's a high degree of government oversight, make them three different certification hierarchies so that you have to switch ID files to move between the different environments. That really prevents accidents from happening across the three separate domains. Um, if you've got those three separate domains, you'll need some pretty formal deployment processes. And you'll need to put together some very detailed steps that say, okay, when we want to go from the development environment into testing, how does that happen? Well, if they're in two separate certification hierarchies and two separate notes domains, you'll need somebody who's cross-certified into both domains to make it happen. That's an excellent opportunity for a gatekeeper function, and you'll want that to probably be, in this example, we have that uh, being performed by an administrator. Define some roles in your deployment process. You'll probably have lead developer, lead tester, lead administrator, maybe supporting developers, supporting administrators. And then put together this deployment process that walks them through the process step by step. Um, I wanted to leave some time for Q&A, so I've got about one minute left. Uh, this process that you've 
I've walked you through just the barest minimum of, uh, is in use at a lot of large organizations. One in particular is a pharmaceutical manufacturer. Um, their pharmaceutical products division implemented this. The thing about the pharmaceutical industry is they're very highly regulated by the FDA. Um, the FDA can shut you down if your notes application can't be shown to be in compliance with what you tested and proved it works. So for them to spend, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars on a really thorough approach is money in the bank. Um, they found when they implemented these practices, their average application development time was reduced by approximately 20 percent. That's non-trivial, obviously. That's some really good savings. What they were most pleased with, though, was that maintenance, when you have to go back in and tweak things, because the ACL of the GDK allows the end users to maintain their own keywords, uh, their maintenance from, you know, uh, I have to maintain somebody else's app went down by approximately 50 percent. And using the triage approach to project management, they find that some of the very simplest applications, you know, where they give you like a blank form and all I need is this form, kind of like, you know, create, read, update, delete type of applications, they can create some applications in like one to four hours. So they churn those babies out like clockwork and they're very pleased about that. Um, I want to get to the Q&A, so I'll very quickly just go over these. I think if you have a standard approach and if you build a, a data directory like Lookup, if you build the CDE, these template approaches in your own environment, um, you'll get faster application development. Why? Because it's already pre-built. Uh, I see some people leaving. Uh, I will, uh, if everybody will turn in an evaluation form, I'll have one of the Lotus people select two names at random and we'll actually package up, burn a CD and send this to you. So please fill out the evaluation forms. Be sure to give them to Catherine and Hideaki before you leave and that'll get you in the yes. I see somebody holding up an eval form right now. Thank you, Hideaki. Um, the other thing is that if you can build applications faster, obviously, you lower the development costs, and that's a good thing. If your developers can work faster, each developer will make more applications. Um, here's an important thing that's often forgotten. If you do this, what you do is you raise the new developer's skill immediately by an order of magnitude because now they're working the best way or perhaps just your way, they're working the way that you want them to work. So you dramatically increase um, their skill level and you're in effect lowering the bar for new entrants into your organization. There's much less rework regarding keywords, database lookups, databases never stop referring to each other correctly because of replica ID breaking. Um, this is something that you may not consider and it will hopefully give you the authority to spend some money in your organization to spend the time to do this. Training costs are lower. If every application looks and behaves pretty much the same, A, users enjoy that. They like a predictable look and feel. But also, if I know three of these applications and the fourth one comes online, it's very easy to train users because they already know your paradigm. They're already familiar with your standard. So each new application, the 7th, the 10th, the 132nd, is lower and lower cost to train them on. And of course, most importantly, is they're more reliable. Um, we can skip past all that. I do want to get to the Q&A. So there's my contact information. Um, if you would like a copy of this presentation, just send me an email. That's rechendia at experio.com. I'll be more than happy to send you this materials. And we also have some, I'll attach some white papers that talk about how you flesh out the approach. I'll get to your question. My name is Richard Echandia. Thank you very much for coming. If you'd like to ask questions, please come up to one of the microphones and I'll be happy to take your Q&A. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of Lotus Square. Actually, I could, we've done a lot of this, and I've worked with you before, Richard. It's Twyla from MD Anderson. Oh, hi, Twyla. And uh, one thing I wanted to suggest what we did is we actually worked with a graphic artist on doing our standards, and it was a wonderful experience. We took some time. We actually trained my developers in graphics, but having her here, not only do we have a consistent design, but it's a really good-looking one. Right. And by the way, uh, a little self-serving ad here. Twyla went through some training that uh, showed her developers how to do this. And how many developers do you have, Twyla? Uh, six now. Six. So she's six developers that all use a standard approach, which is great. Yes, sir. Uh, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, the CDE and the G GDK that you showed looked great. It looked like a great starting point to develop in-house standards for my organization. Right. 
Are those available anywhere to use as a starting point? Um, it, you know Team Studio, the Team Studio design system? Yes. They have a training class called Life Cycle, and in the class you get the GDK, the CDE, you get a bunch of that stuff in the class. There's no website where you can download them from, though. Send me an email and let's talk. We give this whole framework away for organizations that do consulting work with us. If, if you bring us in as a consulting organization, we just give you this stuff. So even when we leave, you have it all. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. Thank you. Um, do you, uh, how do you build the cost of developing this? Okay, so I'm a consultant. Right. I would like to bring some, something like this to my clients. Right. Obviously, this has a cost internally to your organization to have developed this whole thing. And right. It didn't create overnight and it wasn't magic. How do you build the cost of this into the, the benefit? Uh, how do you trade off how little, how, how, how little time it takes to create a new app for one of your clients? Right. How do you trade that off against the investment you already made okay. into making it easy? I, I think I understand your question. There's two things that happened. One, what happened to us, and two, what I would like to suggest for everybody in the room. One, we were paid by a client many years ago to put something really formal together like this. So we got paid to do it. What you should start doing today in your organizations to start building this approach is do what I did four years ago. I knew as I day to day, I thought to myself, I'm going to have to build this someday. So I constantly walked around with this, okay, I put this away and start create a subdirectory, burn a CD every now and then with junk that you know is going to go into it. What will eventually happen is you'll have to kick off a project to actually build this stuff. I would like to suggest that it's a beach time project that you, as uh, people come on the beach and they're not actually billable, you put them on the project. Or if you're internal, you have to get a formal project cut for it and say, look, if I can reduce 20% of my development time, I can pay for that back in X number of months or Y number of projects. You'll have to do a standard ROI cost-benefit analysis on it and pay for it that way. But start today thinking about, ooh, that's a widget. I can use that. And start getting everybody excited about this kind of stuff and start getting people together. It tends to gather steam and everybody gets excited in it. Okay, uh, one more question further on to that. Um, do you continue to charge the customer as though you didn't have this tool? No, no. One of the, uh, as a consultancy, one of the things that you'll find, or even in your internal organization, sometimes you have competing notes development shops within one company. I don't know if anybody's got one of those. The value of something like this is you say, look, you should work with us because your costs will be lower. We, look how much we have pre-built, Mr. Client. Look how reliable it's going to be because we have it pre-built. It becomes a differentiator for you in the marketplace. Okay, thank you. Or within your own organization. Uh, hello, my question is uh, mostly regarding to the global uh, database. Uh -huh. because, uh, I suppose you have a standard form to define your keywords, yep. and these keywords most of the times uh, are related to corporate data, and it's inevitable sometimes that you have not uh, making notes work as the relational uh, thing, but you know, you have a, a keyword like region right. and another keyword like countries and you need uh, to define somewhere a keyword, I don't know how, uh, to, to, to correlate which countries belong to each uh, uh, region. So how, sure. do you have a way to do We've that? Done, we, we, I didn't get a chance to show it. If you've got what we internally refer to as a two-stage or a cascading lookup where you'll go look up a list of countries, then you have within that country a list of regions, what you do is you build two keywords. The first keyword, or several keywords, the first would be your list of countries. You'll get back the country you want. You then create country name hyphen regions. So you'll have UK-regions, US-regions, and we have the one lookup say, okay, now I know I need this other one. And we build some logic that way. In the life cycle class that Team Studio has, the, that's actually documented and they teach you how to do that. Thanks a lot. Sure. For database aliases and keyword aliases, mm -hmm. um, seven months in we're going to say that alias is not representative of what this really is because now it's going to double up to something else. Okay. How do I change that alias organization wide? Uh, Team Studio Configurator? Uh, no, I, the, oh, I, the value of tagging each keyword, for each keyword I know 
I have a choice, what I'm doing is I'm doing a DB lookup of all the databases in my GDK so I know which databases it's used in. So I can say, okay, um, I will look at this keyword, let's say it's company divisions, doesn't accurately reflect, I'll know that I'll have to go back into these two applications and then look for, using a searching tool or the design synopsis, look for instances of this particular string, quote, company divisions, and replace it there in code. It's no easy change, but at least you know where you're going to have to go and you can use automated tools to make it faster. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sure. Hi, when you created your new application, you turned off the inherit des um, design Ooh. future design changes from the template. Right. It seems like you would want to inherit design changes, so why do you turn them off? Excellent question. I apologize I didn't get a chance to show that. In my CDE, there are some things that are going to have to be application specific, like a menu. There's no way I can pre-build a menu with the right choices. I can build the shell of the menu that show you'll have a choice here, you'll have a choice here. But I want some things like my standard subform. This can always work exactly like it is without any modifications. But some things like... Um, pages, I don't. So what I've done in my design template is some of this stuff, you notice it says inherit from design template is blank, but other things that I do want to inherit over and over and over again are at the element level going to inherit because it's in the property of the individual element. So rather than me getting the entire template design every night with the designer task, I want those reusable components to stay standard. A nutty example is let's say I have a new CEO come in and their very first action on taking the company because they're a Harvard MBA is they want to change the standard form header from blue to green. That's their big action plan. I change this in my template. I let the designer task run overnight, and overnight all my applications get upgraded to the new powerful green standard form header instead of the blue form header. Okay, great. Thank you. That, that answer it? Yeah. Cool. Um, if you're going to create local replicas of apps you create, would you also need to create a local replica of the GDK then? Yes. The GDK, here's a tip, should not allow rich text fields. We've intentionally kept the GDK as light as possible to make it a mobile resource. Yes, you do have to create the GDK locally. Remember I talked about in the GDK how I have this capability to make local replicas and it automatically brings everything down? It doesn't give you any choice in the matter. It also puts the GDK down locally. But by not allowing rich text fields, you keep this thing really small because it's textual fields. The pharmaceutical manufacturer had that is one of our bigger installs for this. They have, I think, about five or 6,000 keywords. They have hundreds of database location documents, and the size of the database is like four meg. It's really reasonable because you don't allow rich text. And what about the, um, anytime you're going out to a database A to database B lookup? The, so you have database A, and you're going to go look at database B. Sure. Database B also has to be replicated then, correct? Yes, and, and by by configuring in the database definition or the database location documents, you're enforcing what comes down to the user's desktop automatically. Because you uh, don't reference any server in that code, right, it right. just goes to The Lotus script like. and the formula language, which does this database to database lookup, I'll quickly pop that up for you, um, actually has all that already cooked in there, that it looks how you're doing the uh, it looks, if you're on a server, it will use it on the server, and if you're local, it'll use it on the local. So it automatically knows to make that decision, and you don't get tripped up by not having an application refer to something else that you need. Cool. Anybody else? Oh, we got one. Um, we, we already use your um, spreadsheet for costing our projects, but we do have problems with scope creep. Have you any tips on that? Uh, do I have any what on scope creep? Tips on how to cost Don't allow it. <laughs> um, it, it, it depends, uh, you know, that's, <laughs> like I know the answer to that question. Uh, some tips are visit with your users of the application more frequently. The ability to use a common template is gonna answer a lot of questions off, off the, you know, off the, top right away. The other thing is that if you have a formal UI standard, you're certainly not going to be in UI scope creep because you say, I'm very sorry, but we have this corporate standard. We have to do it this way because the bad guys on the admin staff won't let me do it otherwise. No, it's, Regarding, it's, it's generally functionality scope creep. Yeah. 
meet with them often, demonstrate frequently, be sure you have the right people working on the project that can actually speak to the subject matter experts and get sign off as frequently as possible. So when you're up on the roof nailing the shingles down, they don't come back around and say, oh, we didn't tell you we wanted a basement. So meet with them frequently, lots and lots of JAD, you know, be as JAD as possible, joint application, work with them frequently. Okay. And do you also have any um, tips on a, a more scientific approach to estimating um, form and view development time? Uh, scientific f estimating for what? Just uh, the time it takes to develop a form and view rather than just sort of get a form a or day. view. Yeah. Estimating is one of those tough things. Some people are really good at it. The only tip I have for you is that estimate four or five projects collect the actual time cost, go back and see how far off you how far off you were. I didn't show the slide, I blew past it because of time limitations, but you need to, as part of your deployment process or your final, have a final pat on the back meeting, hey, we really did good. You go back to your office and someone within your organization will need to say, boy, we really missed that. I mean, we thought it would take four, it took us 15. You then build that into your standard spreadsheet so that going forward you don't make that same uh, mistake again. It's, it's a cycled approach. The, your, your, your spreadsheet will be pretty rough in the beginning, but it'll hopefully get refined as you go through the process more and you know the skill of your developers. Okay, thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Can you, can you just go over that uh, default ACL thing with, real quick? Sure. It's in uh, any database? In the common design elements that you're going to build in your organization, you're going to come up with this template, right, that has uh, all of your design objects that you like. The access control list has square brackets. And any ACL entry that's in square brackets in a template, so what's your name? Duncan. I'm going to put Duncan in square brackets in my CDE. And now when I say file database new, I'm going to base it on the CDE. And now, in the ACL of this database, there's Duncan automatically. So you put it in square brackets, and when you build the new database from it, it automatically inherits that. Great. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. No, I'm sorry. You have to track me down. There you go. affect the access control of the CDE itself? No. It's only new databases built from the template. Was that helpful? Was that good? All right. Thank you very much.